Hello. Ready for some more science, Salford? Ready to have your brains fried? Yeah. Okay. In 1944, an Austrian physicist by the name of Erwin Schrödinger. Some of you may have heard the name Schrödinger's cat. The famous paradox: the guy who puts the cat in the box, and somehow the bo- the cat is both dead and alive at the same time. I'll try and explain what this all this is all about. With Erwin Schrödinger in 1944, he was one of the pioneers of quantum mechanics, one of the greatest, most important theories in the whole of science. In 1944, he published a book called "What Is Life." You see, until that point, from the late 19th century, the first half of the 20th century, physicists ruled. We were the top dogs in science, and all the big discoveries. I, you know, chemists and biologists out there may disagree, but back then we had, you know, the Einsteins and, and others who were revolutionising physics. Erwin Schrödinger was one of the pioneers of this new theory of quantum mechanics. Physicists became so cocksure of themselves, so arrogant that they felt they could answer all problems in science. His book, What, What Is Life. Was 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 somewhere where he 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 felt he could try and use physics to explain life itself, physics to explain biology. Now he was very ambitious in this project. It did influence and inspire many other scientists. In fact, Francis Crick and James Watson were inspired by his work in their discovery of the DNA, the double helix. In fact, Fra- Francis Crick was himself originally a physicist. Two decades later, in the early 60s, 1963, another physicist published a paper which didn't really make a big splash. His name was Per Olof Lauden. He was a Swedish physicist, and he wrote a paper about biology. He wrote a paper in which he suggested a way that DNA might mutate. Now, DNA are these two strands of very complicated molecules wrapped around in this double helix, and DNA contains the blueprint of life. And you know, we hear these days that biologists are mapping the human genome. We've made tremendous strides in the last decade. Well, back in 1963, Loudon was trying to understand what is it that goes wrong, or actually, not wrong. We need mutations for life to evolve, to change. How do mutations take place? And We sort of know there are lots of different mechanisms. It's, sometimes it's just random copying errors when these two strands unravel and split, and then they make another pair of strands and they replicate. Sometimes just things co- copy wrongly. Sometimes you get radiation from outside, even cosmic radiation from outer space that comes through and collides with the DNA inside our cells and causes them to to to, to break and and and、um, new patterns form. Loudon said there might be another way. The two strands of DNA are held together by it's, it's like a, a think of it, it's like a ladder that's sort of twisted round. Those rungs of the ladder, the glue that holds the two strands together, are basically hydrogen atoms. Hydrogen atoms provide the glue. They're bonds. They they bond to a to an atom on one strand and to an atom on the other strand and keep them fixed together. Loudon suggested that maybe. This hydrogen atom can do something rather strange, something quantum mechanical, something called quantum tunneling. Basically, it might be sitting closer to one atom on one strand and spontaneously, for strange quantum reasons, jump across to the other side. Because if this happens, the structure of the molecules of DNA will change. A mutation could take place. Now. It was a mathematical model. He had no experimental evidence that this takes pl- that this would actually take place. That's nearly half a century ago. To this day, we don't know whether quantum tunneling explains certain types of mutations. But in his paper, in the very first paragraph, he says the fact that quantum physics might explain certain phenomena in biology would lead me to propose a new. Area of science, a new field, which I would call quantum biology.、And、it sort of went quiet, and nothing really happened. In the last few years, certainly in the last three or four years, 
quantum biology as a new field has started to gain prominence again. Not because the physicists, the quantum physicists, have got cleverer in some of their wacky ideas, but because the molecular biologists have got very clever in designing experiments to test the wacky ideas. I'll give you a few examples in a moment, but let me just say something about what quantum mechanics is. It was discovered at the early, in the early part of the 20th century. Once people like Ernest Rutherford was the first person to look inside an atom and saw that atoms were actually mostly empty space with a tiny little nucleus and electrons buzzing around the outside like a miniature、um, solar system. They realized they needed to try and understand the structure of these atoms, and they realized that the normal laws of physics that everyone understood, going back all the way back to Isaac Newton, just didn't seem to work. Strange things were going on down at the level of atoms and below, and they realized a new type of mechanics, not Newtonian mechanics, but what's called quantum mechanics, had to be developed. And throughout the 1920s, this became a full, powerful mathematical theory. Today, quantum mechanics is really not in doubt. Quantum mechanics tells us how the electrons fit around atoms in orbits. It tells us how atoms fit together, the forces between them, to make molecules, to make everything we see、uh, in the universe. But quantum mechanics is is down at the level of atoms. We don't see generally the effects of quantum mechanics on the everyday scale. It happens at such tiny scales that are completely invisible to us, and yet. We design experiments all the time in physics labs that seem to prove, one, time and time again, that quantum mechanics really works. Quantum mechanics therefore underpins a lot of physics, pretty much most of, if not all, of chemistry. Chemistry underpins biology. Basically, biology at the molecular level is basically molecules, chemical reactions going on between them and bonds bonding together. Biology is basically organic chemistry. Organic chemistry is basically quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is. I would argue the most important, the most powerful theory in the whole of science. It, it beats Darwinian natural selection with one arm behind its back, and、uh, Darwinian natural selection is is one of the greatest ideas humankind has ever come up with. But at its heart, quantum mechanics is strange. So strange that one of the founding fathers, Niels Bohr, once said, "If you're not baffled by quantum mechanics," Then you haven't understood it. You have to be. You have to think. How can that be? That that's. If you think, yeah, okay, yeah, I get it. You haven't got it, because it really is ungettable at a sort of common sense level. It really is strange. Quantum mechanics really does say that an atom can be in two places at the same time. One atom. Weirdly, when you look to see which place it really is. It'll, it'll disappear in one place and pop up in the other. So, how, well, how do you know it was in two places at once? We can design experiments that will prove that had it not been in both places at once, you wouldn't get the results that you'd see. An electron, the tiny particle that orbits around an atom, spins, not in the way that the Earth spins on its axis, but in a rather strange way. To the extent that an electron, when we are not looking, is spinning both clockwise and anticlockwise at the same time. It sounds like oh, you know, you boffin physicists come up with all this nonsense. How do you know it's it, that's what really happens? And without that, we wouldn't have so much of modern science. Any one of you who uses any device, smartphones, TVs, computers, anything with a chip, all rely on quantum mechanics. Without quantum mechanics, we wouldn't have understood the nature of matter. We wouldn't have understood the nature of semiconductors. Therefore, we wouldn't have developed、um, chips. We wouldn't have computers. Most of modern technology today relies on quantum mechanics, and yet, at its heart, it's very, very strange. Well, I've said, you know, biology, at its heart, is chemistry, and chemistry is basically quantum mechanics. So, surely, biology ultimately relies on quantum mechanics. Well, it does rely on quantum mechanics in the In the sense that quantum mechanics describes how the atoms fit together to make the molecules of life, but this new field, this field of quantum biology, is really asking whether the weirder aspects of quantum mechanics play a role in biology. Just 
Last week, week before last now, the Nobel Prize for Physics was announced, and it was given to two physicists who led two research teams, one in Paris and one in Boulder, Colorado. These, so the, 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 the two guys who won the Nobel Prize, they were essentially because they were the team leaders, but really the credit goes to these two teams. What they've done over the last decade or two is design experiments that show that quantum weirdness really does happen. You might have heard phrases like quantum entanglement or quantum coherence. In the physical world, in the, in, in, so the, when, by, by physical I mean the non-living, non-biological world, we do see these quantum effects all the time. Quantum tunneling, for instance, is weird. Quantum tunneling is, is equivalent to, it's a bit like Harry Potter and his friends when they run through that brick wall on platform nine, is it nine and a half? Well, I forget what, in, in, in King's Cross Station, right? Magic. In the quantum world, that happens all the time. Particles run through walls. Uh, it, it's like you kicking a ball up a, up a slope, up a bump, and you've got to kick it hard enough for it to get to the top and roll down the other side. If it's a quantum ball down at the level of atoms, you could kick it halfway up. It hasn't quite got enough energy to get to the top. It doesn't want to roll down again and thinks, eh, I'd like to be on the other side. Disappears and reappears on the other side, like a magic trick. But that's what happens. That's the reason we're here, because that's the reason, re reason our sun shines. The reason where the sun gets its energy is from a process called thermonuclear fusion, and thermonuclear fusion is basically atoms of hydrogen, basically the nuclei of atoms of hydrogen, protons squeezing together. Now, protons both have positive electric charge. And, as you sure remember from school, like charges repel. The positive and positive, you can't push them together. And the closer you push them, the, the harder they will repel each other and want to fly apart. And yet, in the sun, they do stick together, because hydrogen gas in the sun is slowly being converted into helium gas, the next element in the periodic table. And in the process of that change from hydrogen to helium, a lot of energy is produced, energy in the form of heat and light. What happens is the protons are not tiny little, real little balls that are very, very small. They're like fuzzy, wavy objects that can get close enough to each other, and they're sort of wanting to repel each other but every now and again, one of them says, oh, I'd, I'd like to punch through that force barrier and jump through to the other side. Once they get close enough together, they will stick because there's another force that wins over their repulsive electric force. That nuclear force is what binds the two protons together. But without quantum mechanics, we wouldn't understand how they'd ever get close enough for that nuclear force to win. And yet it does happen. So quantum tunneling happens all the time in the world. I want to tell you very briefly two effects in quantum biology. One that relies on electrons spinning two ways at once, and one that relies on quantum tunneling. The robin is the, the, probably the uh, most common bird in, in Britain, our best loved bird. Robin live, uh, robins live in, in, in Britain all year round. But the European robins that live in northern Europe and Scandinavia and Russia Many of them migrate during the winter. They migrate down to southern Europe, even to the northern uh, tip of Africa. And they, birds are able to navigate using a, a wide variety of very clever tricks. It's turn, it turns out, after many years of study, that the European robin navigates by sensing the Earth's magnetic field. It's a very, very weak field, but it senses it. And it doesn't sense it like a compass. It doesn't somehow have a built-in GPS compass system that sort of tells it, you know, which direction it should be going. It turns out it's sensitive to much subtler changes in the magnetic field, and no one could really understand how that happens. It turns out the most likely scenario is one based on quantum mechanics, that inside the retina of the robin's right eye, not left eye, They've ruled that out with experiments. Inside the retina of the robin's right eye are, tiny, are proteins, tiny molecules called cryptochrome, um, that are sensitive to light, because that's why they're in the bird's eye, in particular light with blue wavelength. Now, sunlight is, has all colors of the rainbow, all wavelengths, but particularly blue light has a particular energy, 
And what that does is knock an electron from one of the atoms inside this cryptochrome protein. And those ele that electron will jump far away from uh, its partner that it's spinning with. Now, these electrons, are, their fates are intertwined, they're entangled. And yet, when they, when they move far apart, they remain over distance, somehow in, in, some, in, in instantaneous communication with each other. And it's when they move apart that that, that distance means the, the action of these atoms is sensitive to the, to the changes in the Earth's magnetic field. And any changes will change the different chemical reactions that these proteins will produce, sending signals to the brain, allowing the bird to, to, to know where it is and which direction to move in. So even something as, as non-quantum-y as how the European robin navigates would appear to require quantum mechanics. But I, I want to end with the idea of, of Loudin and, and the suggestion that DNA mutations might take place. That's something that we're now becoming more interested in again. We just need to find out how do we, how do, can we prove that quantum tunneling, the, the same process that drives the energy of the sun, might also drive mutations and evolution in, in life. Bio biologists are getting very clever with their experiments and they can isolate the DNA and they can look at the, these processes. At the moment, we're at the stage where physicists are trying to develop very sophisticated models. Chemists, organic chemists, have developed very sophisticated computer programs that can model hundreds or thousands of molecules and how they all jiggle about and move. And, and they make a prediction that the biologists then carry out experiments to test. If it turns out that quantum physics does play a role in mutations, we really don't know where that will lead, what applications it will have. Just one hugely speculative example, for instance, which researchers in America are interested in, is whether we can understand those mutations responsible for cancer. So how a cell becomes cancerous tends to rely on several highly unlikely mutations. And yet cancer is everywhere. It'll affect one in three of us at some point in our lives. If quantum mechanics is responsible for mutations, then we might be able to control those mutations. Now, I'm not suggesting that quantum mechanics is going to be the cure for cancer, but this is a, a new, young, speculative area of research where physicists, chemists, and biologists are coming together, and who knows where it may lead in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>